Hemings is America's culinary founding father. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Norman Carter, representing Big Gold Belt Media. Uh, very pleased and honored to be joined today by two great men, uh, Chef Anthony Warhan and also the amazing Chef Ashbel McElveen. Thank you all so much for taking the time to spend with us today. And as we were discussing before we came on, got a chance to actually watch you all's documentary that you did, James Hemmings, Ghosts in America's Kitchen. It is now streaming globally. I recommend anybody who is watching now, if you have not done so, to go and see it. It is an hour's worth of amazing information about, honestly, the first, the father of American culinary cuisine and pretty much the first cooking school and a lot of first in it. So gentlemen, both thank you for your time. I want to know what went, to, what went into taking this from an idea to a finished product. Take me through that process. Quite the journey. And Ash Bell was on a long journey before he and I ever met. So I will let you take it away, Ash Bell, and kind of how you discovered James Hemmings and, and experienced him firsthand. Well, <clears throat> well, the journey has been 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 a long one for uh, of, of, of really discovery and commitment. And uh, I um, had done a dinner at the James Beard House in honor of Thomas Jefferson and the Africans that cooked in his kitchen, in quotes. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about James Hemmings. And a few months later, I was awakened in the middle of the night. And um, all I could hear was, how could you, of all people, forget me? And uh, being raised in South Carolina, I knew all about hands. And I knew, oh, there's a visitation. <laughs> and hands are not happy ghosts, OK? <laughs> and, <laughs> So I was, uh, every hair was standing on end. And it took me a, a, a month or so to figure out what had happened. And um, I started that journey on discovery of who this person was. And, um, and a friend, Steve Renatus, connected me to Anthony Warren, who had been tangentially interested in working on his own James Hemings project. Mm. And when we met, it was really uh, a, a very spiritual, very soulful, and uh, and we shared um, a responsibility to tell the story, an obligation to tell the story. So I'm um, I'm grateful that that you in Gen X, actually Gen Z, excuse me. Um, <laughs> actually embracing this documentary because, you know, it, I literally made it with your generation in mind. Go ahead, director. Well, well said. I mean, it, it was um, too many coincidences to not almost see it as an obligation. As Ashbell said, there was, um, it's, it's very strange for two people who are really, really interested in this guy that nobody knows about. That is this hidden story to find each other and, and all the more strange from my point of view, because I had been interested in writing a, uh, a screenplay about a Hemmings story. Cause I, I had come upon the story in a, in a book that I read and got more interested and just had that reaction that many people have had, which is wh why do I not know this guy? Why is this a name that I'm hearing for the first time? Not only what he contributed, but his stories, his experience, it's, it's the stuff of movies and somehow it's, it's not, you know, a known thing. So I started writing this and Steve Granados, a uh, wonderful man. I just happened to overhear him on set on a different project talking about his friend who is the founder of the James Hemmings Society. I literally o overheard that over my shoulder and mm -hmm. um, eyebrow went up and I had to investigate that. He connected Ashbell mm -hmm. and I and it was, um, yeah, we, we were very, very clear right out of the gate that we were going to do something. I don't know if we knew exactly what it was when we no, first- we didn't set out yeah that that was a journey in and of itself figuring out what what is this project going to be going to be well they always say you know luck is when preparation makes opportunity so the fact that two very distinguished individuals on their own were interested in the uh great man james hemmings and then to have you all's paths cross and now produce this amazing film i mean honestly anybody watching if you have not done it i encourage you to do it because it is truly 
a breath of fresh air. It's a lot of information that is amazing. And considering Thanksgiving is next week, might get a little tips in there to alter a couple of dishes that you have for next Thursday. Mm -hmm. uh, both of you as well, once you got together, what went into how you were going to tell this story? That was also a, uh, a little bit <laughs> organic. Um, and if you had asked us month to month, it might change. There were m multiple um, would-be partnerships. A lot of people were interested in this. We had did a, a, a sizzle reel, which is like a three-minute sales piece. Mm -hmm. And we would kind of craft what exactly we were selling based on the audience. So if it was a, you know, a production company who had history doing docu-series, yep, that's what it is. If it was somebody who yeah. wanted to have a, a scripted show, that's what it was. And everybody was interested, but they could, I could just sense there was this fear. There was this trepidation to go all in. We would get right there. It, nobody would pass on it, but it would just sort of sit on the vine. And I think we realized that we had to, to save our own lives, as Ash Bell likes to say, yeah. and sort of take yeah. the destiny <laughs> in our own hands and we had the means to do it. So why don't we, you know, let's do other interviews. Let's sit down with Therese Nelson and Tanya Hopkins and Heather Johnston, you know, in, in, in Brooklyn and talk to them. These are other great culinary minds, thought leaders um, who know about James Hemings and are involved in the, the James Hemings Society. Let's see if we can get Michael Twitty. You know, before you knew it, it, it was just sort of happening in front of us. And um, it was tough because we don't have any visuals of James. We don't have the ability to lean on stock footage or old, old photographs or writings. So we just sort of had to find a way visually. And luckily in the food world, that does kind of <laughs> come naturally. There is always a visual element to food um, to sort of populate this film without being able to just do see and say and showing the, the, the times and the people that we're talking about. But I think all of that worked because of storytellers like Ash Bell, like all the folks who are, are in the film, it's, it's their voices. It's coming through their emotions. And I think that's why it works. How about you, Chef, in terms of what was it that you knew that you needed to have included in this film? Well, as a, as a, a Black American who grew up in segregated South Carolina, going to schools literally segregated by law, mm -hmm. I knew, and this story had to be told. And you know, having coming from a family that thought good food was birthright and uh, literally or part of this whole tradition of African-Americans creating fine dining in America. So I literally grew up with the people in my family. My mother was a working chef when she passed away. Um, my uncles, my father was an incredible barbecue pit master and an amazing maker of moonshine and bourbon. Uh, so I got, I got the spirits on one side from my father and, and also the barbecue. But from my mother, I got really fine cooking and what was considered just Southern cooking um, long before the term soul food, um, which didn't come into play until James Brown made the song, I'm Black and I'm Proud. Uh, so to actually highlight James Hemings' story, which is just amazing in itself, that he went to France at age 19. I also went to France at age 19 as an exchange student. So I identified with, with him learning the language, et cetera. But, you know, I, I was just an academic, a student. He literally went to be trained first by a caterer, Combro, and then later at the Chateau Chantilly, where the food was considered better than the food at Versailles, better than the King's Table. Oh, wow. And, and as Jacques Pepin points out in the movie, um, it took him eight years to become a master chef in French cuisine, but it took James Hemings a year and a half. Wow. And, uh, and that just pointed out all of these amazing attributes that this young black man had, and particularly in a place like France that was, that was foreign, new language, new customs. And um, he 
mastered all of them. When he when he uh, finished his training at the Chateau Chantilly, he took over Thomas Jefferson's um, kitchen <clears throat> as the chef, and he supervised a staff of ten French speaking people, and uh, and became the first American to cook at a diplomatic embassy, and uh, and did he wow? He wowed the French. Um, guests at Jefferson's English only soirees in Paris. And um, and to have that resonance and uh, in having so little um, written about him, um, I, I literally had to be uh, the, the young kid sitting in a black barbershop on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> so you know you're going to hear all kinds of stories. Yeah. <laughs> and and I and all you had to do was listen, and you would hear eventually the truth, <laughs> but eventually in a roundabout way. Right. <laughs> and and so I looked at the historic writings and 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 even the 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 writings and interviews that have been done of of um, former enslaved people, and uh, and I could only, I, I heard it as if I was in a barbershop. Mm -hmm. And so I immediately understood their pain and their struggle. And that is one thing that, that created the debt um, that both Anthony and I both felt was the debt of obligation, that this story had to be told. And uh, and so that's really the the bulk of of how the film happened. And uh, as Anthony was saying, we got lots of interest. Um, and you know, we we had the you know an investor who wanted to put in you know a bulk of money, one hundred sixty grand, but didn't you know it was not a right fit mm -hmm. for what we were trying to do. And so we were able to just walk away from that, which is like, oh, well, you're just you're walking away from 160 grand. Right. Well, we were blessed enough to have people like Steve Granadas and 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 many others who donated their time, their expertise, and 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 pure hard cash. To um to kind of make it happen, and and Anthony can talk about the technical folk that that literally just gave a day's work, you know, when they're when they're billing, you know, two grand a day, and they're like, no, 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 we're gonna we're gonna make sure this happens. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Oh, and, it's, it's um, amazing, it really humbling. is. Yeah, yeah. So it, Anthony and, can and speak a little bit more about that. I mean, we, uh, I had the feeling there was a couple potential partnerships, as Ash Bell alluded to, where we, we could have gotten more resources, more money. And I just had a, a feeling, I know Ash Bell did too, that somehow it was going to lead to a place of delay. And it was going to, if we kept our destiny in our own hands, we knew we could get this out there. And that's, yeah. it was that obligation. We were both sure that this had to happen now. Um, I don't know why, but there was a sense of urgency. And when, um, you know, it's available now on Amazon, Amazon Prime Video, as soon as that happened in North America, to be able to go online, to be able to go on Prime mm -hmm. and to see it there, this feeling of, uh, of, of relief. And obviously there's a lot of work to be done, but I, I do feel like it would have taken significantly longer um, to get there if we had complicated our, our universe more. And yeah, people like Mitch Martinez, Paul Bradburn, Dave DeLizza, Xavier Taylor, Gloria Lewis, Bill German. There's a lot of people along the way who were incredibly kind. Tommy Fakovic, um, who, yes, just they got it too, which I think helped us. It encouraged us that other people sort of felt that spiritual push too. Because people won't always do that just because you have a, a passion project. But mm. there really were um, some, some, some angels along the way that helped us get there. And 
you know, now it's marching towards uh, international release, release, which rolls out um, on the 21st of this month, November 21st. It's in the UK and various other countries and over the next couple of weeks, almost worldwide. So it's, it's a little bit different country to country, but various platforms. And uh, if anybody who's looking for it, I'm, I'm confident they'll find it, which is really, really exciting. You know, it took a while to get here. And I think it's great when stories that are long overdue of being told, finally, you start to see the green lights all line up and then you eventually see a finished product. Was there a moment that either of you either shared with one another or kind of knew internally as you were working through it where you were like, all right, this is it. We got the angle. We got it. Like what was, take me through what that was like when you knew that you were then on the path to getting this thing out there. <laughs> Mine was South Carolina, Asheville. I don't know about you, but that that's, that's, that's when I knew we, we were there. Yeah. I, I, in South Carolina was an emotional uh, journey and um, definitely the tipping point for me too, because I, uh, you know, while we were there shooting, I had the pleasure of shooting with my mother's old friend, 93-year-old Mr. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. <laughs> Mr. Jerry Williams. Mr. Jerry. And he remembered, he said, oh, what? I gave you your first job at 10 years old. I had no, I had no clue. Oh, I had wow. forgotten all about that. But he relayed to me um, instances of my mother and the respect she had in kitchens as a young as a young woman um, from older black cooks, and he said that's what made him pay attention to her because an old uh, lady came up to her in the kitchen and said, "Reet, would you taste this, please, and tell me if it is okay." <laughs> he said that he was so shocked. He <laughs> said, "I had to know who that was," and I was so happy to discover that part of of her because she died so young. Mm -hmm. And the day that we were at her uh, grave site searching for her grave and Anthony found the grave. And of, of course I was so emotional at that point mm -hmm. and, um, and blessed to just have somebody like him there who was also a very spiritual person. And I'll never forget the prayers that he just held me and offered. And there was another lady there, too, who offered prayers. And um, that moment, I knew that this was something. And, um, and just recently, I spent, uh, I spent a lot of time in the UK. And I had a restaurant in London. And I did two recent interviews with BBC Radio, both with young Black um, presenters. And they are loving the story. They were just like you, Z. <laughs> they are like grabbing onto it. And they're like, as soon as you get here, as soon as you get here, get here. <laughs> and I thought, wow. I thought, okay, it'll be kind of split. But your generation has grabbed this story and said, now we understand how we got French fries. Mm -hmm. Now we understand how macaroni and cheese made it into our mouths, you know, or French uh, vanilla ice cream and whipped mm -hmm. cream and creme brulee and meringues for your lemon meringue pie. It's for me, it's so amazing that from an enslaved kitchen at Monticello, that those dishes went around the world, not from their country of origin, but from James Hemings's kitchen at Monticello. That is amazing. And when I talked to, um, actually I had a conversation with a Michelin star black French chef. Mm -hmm. And he said, he said, I cannot wait till you get to Paris for the, for the release on the 11th of January. I want you to do something in my restaurant. Oh, nice. And I, you know, and I was like, oh, wow. These, the, you know, Chefs of my generation are like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> but Z, <laughs> you guys are on the ball, okay? And I, I salute you. Definitely. We definitely appreciate that. I, uh, I can yeah. say I had fries for lunch today in honor of this interview. So 
I use it and it's usually <laughs> more fire. So there you go. Um, Chef, one of the most powerful and beautiful scenes of the entire documentary is when you see your mother's headstone for the first time. Um, yeah. It resonated with yeah. me because the first anniversary of my dad's passing is actually coming up on December 6th. And the last yeah. holiday we had together last year was Thanksgiving. Um, yeah. Seeing my dad in the kitchen, a man in the kitchen, is why I started to teach myself how to cook. And so Good. hearing you share about your mother's influence in your personality, your mother's influence in your recipes, your mother's influence in your spirit, share with us what it's like to lose your mother at such a young age in the manner that you did and then how you were able to still excel in every aspect of your life with her as your background. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, he, my mother, I, I tell people all the time, I was raised by a woman, not by wolves. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother had nothing but love in her heart, even though we were, you know, growing up in the, I mean, worse for her, but, but, and when I was born, it was the, the last vestige of chattel slavery, which is Jim Crow, still around. Um, and having that whole uh, experience of, of being in a segregated Black community where you grew up with, with doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs, literally. So right down the block was the professor at the university. And around the corner was the black doctor. Mm -hmm. So everybody lived cheek and jowl, and you saw where you could go. You literally saw it. You didn't have to look at TV. Mm -hmm. You just walked past the house, and it was, you know, you're not walking past without speaking, mm -hmm. and they will all call you out. Well, <laughs> who, whose child is that? And uh, and I grew up with that richness of segregated America, okay, where black businesses thrive. Mm -hmm. And, they, you know, the worst thing that happened to the black community was integration. Mm -hmm. um, so for me to just um, see them get a could do is worth everything. And, uh, and I will tell you, your father's presence is always going to be with you, mm -hmm. and his cooking is always going to be with you, and that is something you just treasure. Treasure that because he gave it to you for a reason, and it and the reason is for you to cherish that and pass that on to the next generation. And um, so that is, you know, I hope it gives you solace, and you you better cook his favorite dish. <laughs> at Thanksgiving, okay? <laughs> I will. That's what you do. <laughs> I will. Okay, good. Good, good, good. I like that. In, in all of the research that you all did, whether it was for this, whether it was in your all's own time before this project kind of started to come to fruition, was there anything that you all learned or a person that made you, that get, kind of gave you all pause and just made you sit back and think like, wow, like this is, I was never aware of this. Was there any did that happened for either one of you? There's a few characters in this orbit that I, I'm blown away by. Hercules Washington is uh, is another one um, who is a, one of the, the kind of founding foodies of America yeah. that just isn't, uh, isn't really celebrated. Funny enough, when you type yeah. in James Hemings on Google, there is one image and one image alone that, that pops up. It's a very nice portrait of a African American cook from who knows when, right? And it's I just assumed that that was James Hemings. It is the image on Google. Mm -hmm. Ashbell informed me. Turns out it is not James Hemings. No, <laughs> um, but it's thought to be Hercules Washington. Mm. And it's not it's not Hercules Posey either. Um, mm. But he was known as Hercules Washington, but his name was Hercules Posey. And he was the chef to George Washington. And mm -hmm. he was America's first celebrity chef because he would sell the leftovers from George Washington's table at 6th and Market in Philadelphia. 
and he would dress up in his great uh, red coat and his shoes shine to the max and linen, a uh, starch white linen shirt. And he would sell to the colonial foodies the leftovers from Washington's table. And uh, he was literally the first celebrity chef in America. So we, I'm obligated to tell these stories. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and James Henney's is just the tip of the iceberg. I think that one of the coolest moments um, as the documentary started wrapping up uh, that you all included was making it a point to call James Hemings a patriot. And oh. considering what that term has been morphed into over the last 10 years or so, what was the thought process behind you all making sure that you called him a patriot, which he is, there's without a shadow of a doubt that he is. What was there any type of discussion on that or kind of how did that come about? Well, I I understood what he faced in Paris. He could have he could have declared his freedom in Paris. He had the the legal right in France to just walk into the Admiralty Court and declare his freedom. And he was among five thousand free black people in Paris at the time. And he hid his status. He hid the fact that he was enslaved to Thomas Jefferson because it was the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was vehemently anti-slavery. Mm -hmm. And if Jefferson or Franklin or John Jay, the first chief justice of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. had said that they actually own human souls, they would have been pariahs overnight. And the reputation and the credit of the young United States would have been disaster. They would have been literally overnight. Nobody would have attended Jefferson's soirees. Nobody would have would have entertained um, Ben Franklin again or loaned money to a very broke early United States. And that's why him returning to America was the act of patriotism and not the fake kind um, of patriotism that is being banded about in, in America's new political system. Not that crap, but the real earnest patriot like Christmas Abbott was the first to fall for freedom. That's what is real patriotism is about. And I was um, talking to somebody, a journalist, and, and said, well, you know, some people are going to call you woke. And I said, well, I'm not woke, but I'm fully awake. <laughs> I like that. And, uh, and that's how I approach all of this. So this is an American story. I'm not shy and retiring. Not just Anthony. We're not wilting. And one hour documentary can't even begin to tell his story. So I've been working on the James Hemings in Paris TV series. Oh, wow. And, um, and the follow up to this trilogy, which is A Patriot's Return to Slavery. So definitely, Ghost in America's Kitchen is a must see so that you actually get prepped for what's coming. It's such a big story. I mean, and uh, yeah. as soon as you get introduced to the world, you find yourself wanting to know more. Uh, mentioning yeah. Hercules and even Joseph Bologna, there are all these characters in yeah. this early American colonial world and these, these adventures and misadventures of the founding fathers we know and these culinary founding fathers and other patriots that we don't know and it does beg for more so i mean it's our hope that this is you know something that whets the appetite and gets that ball rolling gets the snow rolling down the hill because uh i i imagine a lot of people are probably like me once i get into a topic i mm -hmm. want more i i'll watch i'll watch eight <laughs> different documentaries on, on or shows on a single subject once once i'm in and um i i do hope that this uniquely textured history um, 
takes people where it, where it took us. It's funny you say that because I literally, I mean, it could take me three hours to watch a 30 minute show because I IMDB every aspect of every character <laughs> in it and then try to find more and more. So uh, I love to hear that there are future projects that are in the works because I think that that's that what I, when you actually shared that, that he returned back to the States to go back into slavery, which is one of the most atrocious acts that the world has ever seen to experience yeah. freedom, to taste freedom, to almost yeah. have that level of equality that you could never dream of back in the States with slavery. Like just the, the thought process behind that, it's cool to see that that story is going to be told as well. Um, yeah. I'll leave you all with this because I appreciate that you all took this time out to speak with us today. What can more people, younger people in my generation, anybody, what can we do to further this story in addition to, you know, just talking about you all's project? Like how can we get more involved with getting these stories out there to the public? Well, there's a there's a mac and cheese competition on uh, Instagram <laughs> that um, that's just leading up to the holidays. So people that like you that are cooking, you definitely need to to join on to that on Instagram. All right, well, that's all you got to I'm gonna get on that. Yeah, yeah, and and, and but but also to just watch the documentary and share it and get other people to watch it because one of the um, the, the British um, uh, radio personality, he said, I had, to, I had to send it to my grandmother because mm. she had to watch it. And she was like, oh, well, why would I have to watch this? Why, why, why? It's about Yanks. He said, no, 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 Granny, it's about us. Yeah. It's about us. It's about the African diaspora. And that's what I love about your generation is that you see the kinship between the Black folks in Europe and the Black folks in Africa, and you understand that we're one people and that the legacy of the diaspora is important. And, um, and that, uh, you know, I, I'm just so pleased that that's what that's what we can do we can share this story that's the most important thing sharing the social media and share your thoughts about it um that is that helps me that helps inform me as to how to really craft the coming stories yeah and we're on uh, instagram it's at james hemmings movie um, website, jameshemmingsmovie.com, uh, and, and Facebook as well. So yeah, we're excited to connect with as many people as possible because it's, it's more than just a, a movie, this topic, this idea of I mean, food is this thing that connects the past with the present. Um, and this story clearly, um, lives in that space. So it's, it's a living, breathing thing between the macaroni and cheese competition, future projects, you know, we want to create a, uh, a community, hopefully that is aware, one America that is aware, one world that is aware of its, of its past uh, and able to celebrate those things and to properly inform um, younger people as to what, what came before them. So very excited to, uh, to connect with everybody on social media and the film is available now in North America on Amazon Prime Video on November 21st, the UK and other international territories uh, almost weekly after that. So it's it's rolling out worldwide and um, and we hope as many people find it and share it as possible. Gentlemen, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to have been able to speak with you both today. Director Anthony, Chef Ashbell, you all are two amazing individuals for sharing this long overdue story. Wanna you know, wish you all happy, safe and happy holidays. Blessings to your families as well. Again, Thank you all for joining us today. You all have a great one. And thank you, thank you so for much us. for having us. Happy holidays to you and your family and, and stay blessed, brother. Will do, sir. Thank you so much, Chef. Y'all have a good one. Take care, okay? All right, you thank as you. well. Okay, bye-bye.